an Anglo-Saxon peasant farmer is working the land that has been allotted to him by his lord. It has been a tough few years for him. He was involved in the Battle of Hastings and has since been limping on a crippled leg after a horse fell on him. It is hot and his crops need constant attendance. In the distance, he can see dust arising from riders nearby. He thinks nothing of it. But as they get closer, he recognizes the standard that they bear. He had seen it before on the Battle of Hastings battlefield. He realizes that these men represent the king of a conquered England. The two men, a monk and a soldier, menacingly tall on horseback, speak in broken English with a French accent. The monk asks the peasant farmer who he is, if he owns the farm, what the farm has and what is its function. The peasant responds with confusion as to what is happening, but he notices the monk scribbling down all of his responses. This is a census for the king, the soldier states in broken English. Do you understand? The king. Yes, the peasant responds. The soldier looks at him and says, we, oui. not yes. The monk asks the peasant if he swears fealty to his new king, William I of England. With a flashback, the peasant is taken back to the Battle of Hastings as he hears the screams of men and horses galloping. In the smallest of nods, he mutters, we. Oui. The monk nods back and tells him, your mark has been made in the Doomsday Book. Long live the king. <laughs>
a oath of fealty to their king, which meant that if there was ever a war to be fought, the barons had to fight on behalf of their king. These lands that the barons got were absolutely enormous, and at the very centre of this land, they would often build massive castles to keep them safe from possible attacks, and it was obviously also a symbolic rule over the English. Now, the very favourite knights that gained this title were also kind of upgraded into a first-class lifestyle, as they would also gain the title of Earl, which is just one step above Baron in the peerage. But in this case of this video, we are going to lump them all together. These titles, like noble titles today, are hereditary through male preference to primogeniture. When the Barrel or Earl dies, their eldest son gains the title, the land, and all the possessions, therefore keeping the power in one place. At the same level of the nobles, we had powerful bishops and archbishops of medieval England. Remember, Henry VIII wouldn't be born for another 400 years or so at this point, so there's only one Catholic church in England, and they were very, very important. They were wealthy. They were powerful, and they owned much of England's land. Not only that, but the bishops lived like princes, and they enjoyed vast sums of wealth. They also had influence over the ruling elite of the country. Now that we've done the nobles, we need to do the knights. The next step down on the ladder. Because the barons had sworn a fealty to the king, an oath of fealty, meaning that they needed to fight in the king's wars, they needed an army, and each baron would have around 20 knights. And these knights would be given land with castles or a manor house, and they would have to swear fealty to the baron himself. As we go to the last level of the feudal system, they were, of course, the peasants who made up the majority of the medieval society, and they were bound to work the land that their lord had until their very death. Many of them were not allowed to even marry or even leave the land without the lord's permission. These peasants were given small sections of land to farm that they had to work and cultivate and pay rent for as well. I'm sure you can imagine the difference between a kind and a cruel lord could mean the difference between happiness and misery for these peasants. Now, I know it can be confusing, but I want you to think of it like this. The king is the country, and because I live in Italy, I'm going to use Italy for example. So, the king is the country, Italy. The next is the provinces, that is the barons, Lombardia. The knights are the city. Milan. The peasants are the people who work in Milan, and that is how the feudal system was implemented by William, to ensure that his kingdom ran smoothly. Now to the nitty-gritty juicy bit of the Doomsday Book. In 1085, two years before the death of William the Conqueror, he ordered a census that should be written up detailing all the possessions of every single settlement in England. The king wanted to know absolutely everything in his own kingdom. How many people there were, what they owned, whatever other information they could get, he wanted to know it. Once William the Conqueror knew this information, he could tax his people accordingly, so he could pay for his vast armies and his enormous castles. As you can imagine, this collection of this data took an awfully long time. In fact, it took two years where the Norman commissioners were sent all around the country with the order that not one single cow nor pig should escape their notice. In total, they visited an astonishing 13,418 different towns and villages and wrote two million words. It was a monumental effort for anyone at any time. The official name of this record was the King's Roll, but it's more commonly known as the Doomsday Book. Now, why on earth did it have this morbid name? Well, you need to understand that medieval England was deeply Christian, and the Doomsday is a, another Christian name for the Day of Judgment, where Jesus Christ will return to earth and pass judgment on both the living and the dead. 
the Anglo-Saxons, the English, who really didn't like their foreign king, nicknamed the book sarcastically, as if William was forcing them to declare everything that they owned so he could pass judgment on them. Of course, the book was used to increase taxes on the English population, but it's still rarely useful, even today. It gives us a great insight on what England was like in the 11th century, right down to where the beehives and the fishing ponds were. We can even read about the nicknames that the English peasants had for themselves, like Elwyn the Rat and Ralph the Haunted. Even vast cities like England's biggest city today, Birmingham, during that time were mentioned in the Doomsday Book, just as a small village of nine families and two ploughs. When we look at England today, it's a cosmopolitan country. It's modern, it's vibrant. It has massive attempts to increase diversity and inclusivity. But at the same time, it is stooped in history and tradition that spans thousands of years. England was first invaded by the Romans and then the Vikings and the Saxons. But the final invasion of the Normans, after all, was the last invasion. All you have to do is look at the royal family. They can trace their lineage back to William the Conqueror in a history that spans over a thousand years. I really hope you enjoyed this series. Thank you so much for getting this far. Please let me know what you wanna watch in the future by commenting down below. Like, comment, and subscribe, the more you know.